Just let the final people take their seats. Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Rowan Conway. I'm Director of Innovation and Development here at the RSA and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here for this evening's special event. Our Chairwoman um, Vicky Haywood is unable to be with us this evening um, due to some health issues, so I'm standing in her place and Sir Christopher Frayling will take us through as our um, Master of Ceremonies. Before we begin, um, please could you make sure that your mobile phones are switched to silent. We're live streaming this event, and so welcome to our online viewers. If you would like to share your comments on Twitter, the hashtag is RSA RDI. Before I hand over to Sir Christopher Frayling to formally kick off this evening's presentations and celebrations, I would like to thank Innovate UK for their support on this event and an associated project on the future of design for industry that we're very excited to get started on. For 10 years, Innovate UK has been driving growth and working with companies to de-risk, enable and support innovation. Crucially, they recognise that design has a vital role to play in helping businesses to innovate better, grow faster and achieve greater commercial success, which is the forefront of the government's industrial strategy announced earlier this week. This year, through the Design Foundations pilot programme, Innovate UK has funded 90 businesses across a broad range of sectors to engage with the UK's world-class creative industries and carry out early stage design studies, gathering human insight, generating propositions, validating their thinking and communicating the value of their ideas more effectively to investors and customers. We're delighted to be partnering with Innovate UK to celebrate the outstanding contributions of the Royal Designers for Industry and to further the discourse around design's role in unlocking the potential of the UK industry. My role here at the RSA is to lead on innovation and development and design is a fundamental part of this. Design has always been at the core of the RSA's charitable object, uh, objects and I'd like to use my position here tonight to mention the, and celebrate some of the milestones in the design work in the past year. We've strengthened our thinking through the release of a report around from design thinking to systems change, exploring how we might apply, apply a systems thinking dimension to design thinking methods and to power social change through design. We celebrated the next generation of designers for social impact in the 93rd year of our Student Design Awards program and formally launched the Student Design Awards Alumni Network, currently working with these alumni to better understand how we can best support and engage with them no matter where they are in their careers or indeed where they are in the world. We established new collaborations and relationships with Partners in Change in an effort to encourage healthy and open dialogue about the future of design. For example, the partnership with Innovate UK who have supported tonight's event and the upcoming programme exploring the future of design for industry. And of course, tonight we present the RSA's Bicentenary Medal, inaugurate three new Royal Designers for Industry and a new RDI Master. These design exemplars form part of the larger RSA Design Association comprised of RDI faculty, student design awards winners, and RSA fellows committed to demonstrating a clear and progressive account of design in industry and in society. As we move forward into 2018 and beyond, our focus will be on working closely with our partners and networks to explore a role for design that understands its contributions to industry and growth, positive social and environmental impact, and the best of design thinking methodologies to impact real change in an increasingly complex world. To formally kick off tonight's proceedings, I'd now like to invite Sir Christopher Frayling, Chair of the RSA Design Advisory Board, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, everybody? Uh, the, reason, the reason I ask is that uh, um, a while ago I did a, a radio programme all about Henri Matisse and his cutouts. And I did the programme. It went out on Radio 4 in the morning. And that evening I went to the National Theatre and there was a woman sitting in front of me. And she turned around and said, are you the man who made that programme about Matisse? And the woman next to her said, he made a programme about your teeth. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So it's very important you hear me, ladies and gentlemen, loud and clear. Uh, good evening, my name is Christopher Frayling, and as Rowan mentioned, I chair the Design Advisory Board, uh, working closely with the rest of the board and the RSA design team with the aim of integrating and applying design right across the organisation, including, of course, and that's the relevance tonight, working closely with the RDIs. Um, you were probably expecting Vicky Hayward, who is the chair of the RSA, to be standing here, and I'd just like to start with a message that she sent. I'm truly sorry not to be well enough to be with you all this evening, and I offer many, many congratulations to all the invested RDIs, all richly deserved, and a testament to their talent and to everything they've achieved through their astounding careers. This year, 2016-2017, has been 
really a remarkable year for design, uh, particularly in London. Uh, and I don't really have to do the list, but the RDIs had their 80th birthday. We had the opening of the new design museum, which according to tonight's Evening Standard, is making the British public think differently about design just by its existence. The appointment of the youngest ever director of the V&A. Uh, the appointment of Sarah Weir to the Design Council, um, the government's industrial strategy, which Rowan mentioned, with design and innovation as two of its pillars, and Kenneth Grange's appearance on Desert Island Discs, where he chose as his luxury a large book on the Bauhaus, and not so much, he said, as reading matter, but because it would make a great piece of furniture. <laughs> Never let it be said, designers don't read enough. The RSA launched the title RDI in 1936, when the design profession, in this country at least, was in its infancy. And the title was established to promote the important contribution of design in those days to manufacturing industry, hence RDI, with the emphasis on the I, and to honor exceptional practitioners in all design disciplines. So today, 80 years later, to be an RDI remains the highest of all accolades for a designer in the UK. It's the top of the tree, and it's awarded to those who've shown sustained design excellence through work of aesthetic and practical value, how things look and how they work, and also work that is of significant benefit to society. And in recent years, the nominations have been more upfront about that designer's outstanding contribution to society. And this criterion, we believe, is at the core of the best kind of design. It's not a case of either or, and we're committed to celebrating this as part of the RSA's long-standing support for all aspects of design excellence. Because ever since its foundation in the mid-18th century, the RSA has encouraged design and creativity and really been in the forefront of recognizing its importance to our social, economic, and cultural well-being. I always used to think this wonderful frieze by James Barry, I used to think that chap with the beard which what, what looks like a pencil in his hand is a designer, and uh, there's you know, all his acolytes uh, supporting him, but I'm sure it isn't, it's probably Hercules or something. Uh, anyway, um, uh, you know, every, in, in fact, the RSA was already quite old by the time James Barry did this. And in addition to celebrating the RDIs tonight, we also celebrate the next generation of designers who are committed to using their talents for positive social impact. And we're delighted to have some of the 2016 and 2017 RSA Student Design Award winners with us this evening. Now in its 94th year, so the, the Student Design Awards are 14 years older than the RDIs, the RSA Student Design Awards have a global curriculum. And as I'm sure you know, they're a high profile annual competition for design students and graduates, a kind of launch pad. We work closely with our industry sponsors, many of whom are also here tonight, to create a set of design briefs each year that challenge emerging designers to develop and apply their skills in new ways to tackle timely and sometimes urgent social, economic, and environmental issues. We also work with colleges and universities across the UK and around the world to embed these design briefs within the curriculum. And this is one of, I think, one of the RSA's greatest pledges to the future. And in fact, several RDIs were themselves winners of the RSA Student Design Awards once upon a time. From such acorns, great oaks grow. And it's my great pleasure, briefly, to share with you the work of the four winners of the awards we have in the room with us tonight. In 2016, so let's have the first one. In 2016, we collaborated with Philips on The Good Life, a brief that challenged students to develop new patient-centered healthcare solutions. Callum Smith from Northumbria University won with his project Frail T, a system, not everyone, everyone seems to pun these days, it's, it's good, it's good. A system for collecting and analyzing data about grip via a smart kettle, providing caregivers with an accurate daily picture of their elderly patients frailty statistics, so it's to do with how, how hard you, you grasp the kettle and it can actually measure that. Callum has just returned to the UK, having completed his year-long graduate residency programme at Philips headquarters in the Netherlands. Jasmine Robson, Robinson of Norwich University of the Arts won last year's Learning for Life brief with the UK government's policy lab and Go Science which asked students to design a way to stimulate learning throughout people's lives 
and her project is Project UX, a social enterprise with two key aims. Firstly, to provide a user testing device for digital products and services, and secondly, to provide the testers themselves with the opportunity to improve their own digital skills while earning money through a structured program. And this program is targeted at companies which are tri trialing online and digital products and services which are intended for mass use. So it's very, very useful for the trialing of new products. Jasmine won a placement at Policy Lab and is currently working there. And following her RSA award, she's also participated in the Radio 4 program, The Fix, and she spoke at the event, Her Story, Female Pioneers of Service Design, hosted at the RSA as part of the Service Design Fringe Festival. Tom Howell-Jones, from Birmingham City University, won last year's Rework Brief, sponsored by RBS, which asked students to design and develop a vision and a business case for a new product or service made out of disused office furniture. It's a great idea, I think. His project is called Rest, uh, a hard shell rucksack and pannier bag made from the backrest of redundant office chairs. Tom is currently teaching design to school children and is supporting the RSA's Pupil Design Awards, a little sister program to the RSA Student Design Awards, which runs in secondary education. And the final winner who's with us here tonight, this is just a selection of the winners, they're the ones who are here tonight, uh, is Pippa Bridges from Loughborough University, who won last year's Circular Futures Brief, sponsored by Unilever. And the brief asked students to design and develop a product or system for the fast-moving consumer goods market based on the principles of circular design. And Pippa's winning project is Infinity Mascara, a refillable mascara product and service solution where the mascara can be applied to the lashes, get this, with a 3D printed fingertip that fits the user's finger. Pippa graduated this summer, and following the judging panel's recommendation, she's currently seeking support further to develop Infinity Mascara. So if anyone in the room wants to be an angel for this project, uh, this is the moment. She's an active RSA fellow, and last month gave an ex excellent lightning talk about the project at an RSA Engage event on this very stage. And I'd like to ask all these RSA Student Design Award winners to make themselves known to us and to join me, please, and Vicky Hayward in congratulating. Can you stand up, all four of you? Well done. Many, many congratulations. And all of these talented young designers will be downstairs together with their winning projects, standing by their bunks in the Benjamin Franklin room immediately after this event. Uh, I encourage everyone to speak with them about their work and their aspirations. One of the wonderful things about design students, uh, certainly in my experience, is their firm belief in the future and in their ability to make a difference uh, to the future through their work. It's not always something that students share these days, but designers most certainly do. It's now my particular pleasure to present the RSA Bicentenary Medal for 2017. The medal was instituted in 1954 to commemorate the founding of the RSA over 200 years earlier and has been awarded to a variety of individuals for their outstanding contributions to the advancement of design in industry and society over the years. In line with the RSA's current approach to design, the medal is awarded to someone who has, and I quote, used design to great effect as an instrument of civic innovation. This year, we're awarding the medal to Mary Mullen, whom I'm sure is well known to many of you, in recognition of her commitment to the advocacy, encouragement, and promotion of design to benefit society across education and industry. And Mary's been very involved, amongst many other things, as I'll tell you in a minute, in Irish design in Dublin and uh, in Kilkenny. And uh, when I was thinking about last night about the, the citation for Mary, I was reminded of um, a, a dinner I went to in Dublin when I, when I was chairing the Arts Council. And it was one of these uh, dinners where you had a celebrity literary speaker who uh, was going to give a talk after the dinner. And I flew over to Dublin and had a very nice meal. And, uh, and, and just towards the end of the meal, the, uh, 
uh, the host stood up and said, uh, it is customary on these occasions to say that tonight's speaker needs no introduction. Well, tonight's speaker certainly needs no introduction because the bastard hasn't shown up. <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted that Mary has joined us tonight uh, in person to receive a well-deserved medal. Apologies for the accent. Mary Mullen is chairman of the Samisha Black Awards for Distinguished Services to Design Education based at the Royal College of Art in London. And this is the only major award in the world given for excellence in design education, an area that doesn't have nearly enough formal recognition. She's a regional advisor to the World Design Organization, WDO, having been the first woman to be elected to their board and having served as its vice president. She developed their interdesign program in 1971, enabling designers from around the world to develop solutions to local problems of global significance. Mary was Secretary General of the International Council of Graphic Design, ECOGRADA, now ECOD, for 14 years and was a founding trustee of the ECOGRADA Foundation. She's been a consultant for the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in South America and was the national chairman of the Design and Industries Association in the UK. She was and remains a founder member of the Craft Council of Ireland. She was founding director of the National Centre for Culture and Arts in Dublin, which is now the Museum of Modern Art at Kilmainham, and she ran her own consultancy practice in design in London in the 80s and 90s, which included working closely with the V&A's Boiler House project, the precursor of today's design museum, which, as it happens, is when I first met her. But perhaps above all where tonight's concerned, she's been the driving force behind the Samisha Black Award, which has a global focus on designers as champions. It's a kind of Nobel Prize for a lifetime's contribution to design education in its broadest sense, based in the UK. It's something this country is particularly good at, but open to designers and teachers from all over the world. And the award will mark its 40th anniversary next year. It was created in memory of Misha Black, whom some of you will remember, educator and designer, who championed the development of cross-disciplinary design education, in his case, the crossover of engineering and industrial design. His work and his writings on the subject from the early 60s to his death in 1978 led to the United Kingdom being recognized internationally as a leader in the field. And Misha became the first ever professor of industrial design in this country. The award not only honors design educators, but like Misha in his own practice, focuses on the crucial and neglected importance of educators' work in the industrial, commercial, and cultural life of all of us. So Mary, in presenting you with the RSA Bicentenary Medal this evening, we're delighted to recognize and applaud your long-standing commitment to the advocacy, encouragement, and promotion of design to benefit society. And as well as the medal, we also bestow upon you tonight the Honorary Life Fellowship of the RSA. It is richly deserved. Mary, come on up. Here we go. Now we're going to move over to here. Thank you, Sir Christopher, and everyone at the RSA. It's a very inadequate way to say how honored I am to be the recipient of this medal, especially so when I look at the list of those who've received it before me here in this great room. I have an affection for 12 John Adams Street with its echoes of Benjamin Franklin. The room below us is named after him. He too came from Dublin always en route from America, where he helped to found the Royal Dublin Society, the precursor of this Royal Society of Arts. Now Franklin is best remembered as a president, a politician, and a diplomat. But I think of him as an industrial designer. Amongst his ingenious inventions, his distinctive pot-bellied stove kept me warm in, war in winters in a house in Norfolk in Virginia where you could literally see the seed through the floorboards. 
James Barry, to whom Sir Christopher has already uh, referenced, his masterly work, The Progress of Human Knowledge and Culture, was completed in 1771, and it dominates this room. He hailed from Cork. He undertook the commission for no fee, simply asking the society to provide canvas and paints. It took him seven years to complete. Over and above its artistic excellence, it's an outstanding example of voluntary effort. This custom of pro bono work in the fields of education, civic service and mentoring has been carried on by the Royal Designers since the faculty was established. Royal Designers picked up where Barry left off and in reality, rather than allegorically, have been responsible for continuing the progress of human culture into our times. And the RSA student winners here with their colleagues will give form to the objects and systems that will chart the progress of human culture and innovation into the 21st century. Not surprisingly, design educators play a crucial role in nurturing innovation and the Bishop Black Awards a committee comprising of representatives of the major royal institutions and design organizations is the only collaborative voluntary group honoring these largely unsung educators for their distinguished services, particularly acknowledging those who are making innovative strides in the way design education is organized and delivered today. Those who have been honored are not always household names. Their students usually steam, steal the limelight, while the dedicated teachers wait for the next cohort of student designers or innovators to continue this progress of human culture. Now I'm sure some of the most pressing challenges these young designers will face will be elemental. To restore the earth, clean our air, preserve our water, create clean fire for our energy needs. I have some ideas on it, but no time to talk about them tonight. Benjamin Franklin, a man of great wit and pithy phrase, said, he who is wise learns from everyone. And a man wrapped up in himself makes a small bundle. As inventor, designer, and statesman, I think Franklin would agree that leaders in public office, heads of educational establishments, and elected officials in local and national government have an obligation to work together to create environments in which innovation can be fostered and rewarded, and where collective, cross-discipline, long-term, plans that are above politics are put in place to ensure that the progress of human culture and innovation will continue to create a prosperous and safe society that will benefit us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Spot on. Uh, before we focus on tonight's RDI presentations, I'd like publicly to thank, and this really addresses almost everyone in the room, publicly to thank the Royal Designers for their ongoing commitment to the RSA. Through your work with the RSA's family of academies and as judges and advocates of the RSA Student Design Awards and the Pupil Design Awards, you are an inspiration to the next generation of designers using their skills for positive social impact. Following the RDI presentations tonight, structural engineer and deputy chair of Arab, Tristram Carfrey, will be inaugurated as the new master of the Royal Designers. And then, according to tradition, Tristram will give this year's RDI address. Tristram, as Humphrey Bogart says to Claude Rains at the end of the film Casablanca, we're sure this will be the start of a beautiful friendship. In a moment, I thought that was rather funny. There you are. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, you can't win them all. 
In a moment, I'll be handing over to the outgoing master of the Royal Designers, the great fashion designer, educator, and all-round excellent citizen, Betty Jackson, who will be inviting the new members of the faculty to receive their diplomas. But just before doing so, I'd like to thank Betty most warmly for the work she's done in the faculty and in the RSA over the past two years. The role of master of the RDIs owes a lot to the generosity and commitment and sometimes courage of individual RDIs who are keen to work towards meeting the charitable aims of the RSA. And Vicky Hayward wanted me to add this to those words. It's been, this is Vicky speaking, it's been an enormous pleasure to have been given the opportunity to work so closely with Betty Jackson over the past two years. Her grace and her calm judgment, her tolerance to pressure and her ability to think out of the box have all been a real boon to our personal and professional relationship. Above all of that, it's been fun, and I thank her for her generosity and her warm spirit. That said, continuing the quote, I'm very pleased to welcome Tristram as the new master this year and very much look forward to working with him during my final year as chairman of the RSA. Betty, your generous contribution, well above the, and beyond the call of duty has been appreciated by us all. Thank you so much. So, over to you, Betty. It's your go. It's your go. Thank you very much. Gosh, well, that was very nice to hear. Um, yes, well, this is the sort of climax almost of the evening and uh, we're going to kick off there's three worthy folk who are going to come up and uh, I've got a little bit to say about every every one of them so we're kicking off with Alison Brooks Hello. works Alison 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 Brooks studied architecture at the University of Waterloo Canada and after graduating, moved directly to London, all set for an adventure with £500 and a portfolio. She began working with the fabulous Ron Arrod RDI, what a start, and became founding director when he set up his design practice. Establishing her own company, Alison Brooks Architects, in 1996, she's developed an international reputation for design excellence, as well as a strong voice advocating the social responsibility of architecture. ABA's current portfolio ranges from urban regeneration and master planning to public buildings for the arts, higher education and housing. Her residential work has been recognized in the UK and overseas as exemplars of new approaches to large scale housing. Her groundbreaking award-winning Live Work residential de development in New B, in Harlow in Essex set a benchmark for suburban housing while Ely Court in London raised a new standard in mixed tenure urban housing. Alison's work is born from intensive research into the social, cultural and environmental context of each project to develop authentic solutions for buildings and urban schemes, each with a distinct identity, but most of all responding to the needs of individual users, users and local communities. Her belief in the transformative social role of architecture underpins all her work. Her rigorous approach has created environments that are successfully regenerating local areas, supporting the community by building public, industry and local authorities' confidence in their ability to work collectively to deliver financially viable, well-designed environments that meets the needs of their local population. At the heart of Alison's practice is the sharing of her knowledge and expertise to the benefit of the design community and a wider society. She lectures nationally and internationally on architecture and urbanism, has taught at the Architectural Association, and was an external, examin external, external examiner sorry, at the Universities of Bath and Lincoln and is now currently at the AA and the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL. She's an advisor to government, 
a design advocate for London, a trustee of Open City, and a National Design Review Chair for the Design Council, advising on the development of well-designed places across the country. Alison's design approach creating new housing typologies, introducing new forms of mass housing using completely new materials, have brought her wide international acclaim in sectors of national significance. And her realized projects have received global acclaim for their conceptual rigor, sculptural quality, and ingenious detailing. She's committed to design that is responsive to people and places, creating environments that are at the very heart of sustainable growth. And as a result of all of this, Alison Brooks is one of the UK's most acclaimed architects and the only one to date to have ever won all of the UK's most prestigious architect prizes. The Stephen Lawrence Prize, the Mansa Medal, and the Sterling Prize all together. Alison, we're delighted that you're about to add Royal Designers to this uh, prestigious awards and warmly welcome you into the faculty. Myerskoff. Yes, the right. Hurrah. Over her career of 30 years, Morag Myerskoff's design interventions have created and enhanced spaces and places by exploring graphic design beyond its usual two dimensional boundaries. Her bold graphic approach is instantly recognizable and elevates every context in which it is placed. Her work is rooted in creating a sense of joy and belonging for all of those who encounter it, whether it's bringing vibrant color to the wards of children's hospitals or bringing a permanent and fabulously bold graphic presence to the beautifully cool atrium space at the New Design Museum in Kensington. Morag's visual vocabulary is inclusive by nature and its effortless energy resonates both visually and emotionally with audiences well beyond geographical and cultural boundaries. After graduating at the Royal College of Art, she established Studio Myerskoff in 1993 and has consistently produced work of the highest quality. Her award-winning 2007 wayfinding system with Cartilage Levine for the Barbican Center is still regarded as a leading example of systems design. Her work is most notable for its inclusivity, aiming to make places where people feel they belong. And to do this, she invites users to be part of the design process. After working with students to redesign Westminster Academy in 2007, teachers found that grades significantly improved after the children were involved in helping to create a building that belonged to them. This contribution to ed educational environments was recognized in 2015 when her work with Al Alfred Hall Monaghan Morris on Burntwood School won the Sterling Prize for Architecture. From schools and hospitals to cultural hubs and town centers, Morag transforms public spaces by creating engaging experience for, experiences for everyone. The tenth, Temple of Agape, built for the Festival of Love on London's South Bank in 2014, used public space to create an open, interactive symbol of devotion to love in all its forms. This inclusive approach acquires even deeper significance and importance in the hospitals and care sector. Morag has demonstrated a considered and consistent approach to space making that is having a positive impact on the health and well-being of those recovering and working in wards at the Royal London Hospital, Sheffield Children's Hospital and Kentish Town Health Centre. 
where she overcame strict regulations by working with clinicians, patients, and their families to create a positive and uplifting environment for healing and recovery. Her universal visual, visual vocabulary is well suited to the work that the British Council undertakes internationally across the arts. Many remarkable commissions undertaken together prove beyond doubt that her uplifting design work through graphics and color connects with very different cultures from Sweden right down to Mexico. Throughout her career, Morag has been redefining what it means to be a graphic designer. She's expanded the definition of the discipline to include 3D design, systems design, product design, furniture, architecture, and of course, technology, and has championed this collaboration working successfully with fellow designers and architects, as well as writers and artists. Morag, your love of collaboration is well suited to the RDI faculty and the work of the RSA, and we warmly welcome you to the faculty. not least, Mike Rawlinson. Mike Rawlinson studied environmental planning at Essex Polytechnic and began his career as planning assistant at Scarborough Borough Council. An instinctive planner and urban design strategist, he later crossed the country diagonally to join Bristol City Council as a senior urban designer. It was here in 1994 that Mike developed the Legible City Initiative, the UK's first fully integrated programme of transportation, information and identity designed to improve people's understanding and experience of their city. Mike inspired the project as a city council planner and his firm, City ID, became lead designer on the project's launch in 1999. The work, of course, is ongoing because the concept is a living, breathing and evolving project, much as a city itself. Mike recognises that creating a coherent identity for a city is not solely about designing a logo or an object, but rather a deeper and more immersive exercise of drawing out the elements that define a place, creating a palette of materials, colours and icons to distinguish the city's personality. This immediately brings clarity, which is then further refined through the use of heads-up pedestrian maps that orientate people wherever they may be. Mike's approach means stakeholder engagement is at the heart of his design progress. He works to improve one's everyday experience of the built environment and in doing so has enhanced the quality of life for thousands of people. His work characterizes city as progressive, dynamic, and ambitious places. So the legible, the legible cities program has become aspirational, inspiring other cities to follow suit, and commissioning Mike and his team to lead similar initiatives across the UK and internationally, in New York City, and most recently in Moscow. Each design solution is a completely different response to the personality of the particular place, and yet the same in thoughtful, people-first approach. Mike's work is democratic in the most far-reaching sense. His wayfinding transportation and identity solutions impact on all who live, work, and visit the cities concerned. They improve transport by providing the necessary information to users, encouraging them to shift modes, including bike hiring schemes, and walking as credible alternatives. Mike's work also has a knock-on effect in catalyzing regeneration and attractive, attracting investment. A report by Bristol City Council in 2016 
describes the Legible City project as one of Bristol's most successful exports and goes on to say 20 years on the BLC project continues to be just as relevant today in the ongoing development of Bristol as an innovative city, promoting active travel, supporting good urban design and encouraging a sustainable local economy. His mantelpiece positively groans with awards, too many to mention here, except for one of my personal favourites being the DNAD's Wooden Pencil Award and the Graphite Pencil Award, both collected by him in 2015. A leader in urban design thinking, Mike has a profound impact on, impact on city dwellers, involving engagement levels among locals and visitors alike, and unlocking the potential of cities by making them more understandable, exciting, accessible, and connected. Mike, we welcome your skills and experience. They will be exceptionally valuable to both the RSA and the RDI faculty, and we warmly welcome you into the play. all the RDIs. Um, so we're now going to move on to a good bit. Um, one of the nicest things, the nicest tasks in fact, of being master of this great faculty is being involved in the decision as to who steps up next. You find yourself in this enormously privileged position for only two years which sometimes feels like an age, but in fact whizzes us by before you know it. Um, I do want to thank everybody who's helped and supported me during my two years as tenure, but we're going to quickly move on. We had a list. The RSA had a list, the past masters had a list, and the design advisory board had a list. But almost at once someone rose to the top, and it was plain for everybody to see that he was the perfect choice. The telephone call to convince, cajole and persuade apparently came as a complete surprise and he very wisely took 24 hours before calling me back to accept the role of next master. He's hugely talented, has awards coming out of his ears, he's an RDI so that almost goes without saying. He's modern, fast thinking, successful, annoyingly much younger than me. But more importantly, I believe he will work together with the RSA and the Royal Designers to take the faculty into the next exciting chapter. He's completely committed to innovation, aesthetics and excellence in design, so we're definitely in safe hands. Ladies and gentlemen, I am more than delighted to introduce to you all and to welcome Tristan Carfrey as the next Master of the Faculty. I was surprised when Betty rang me. I'm still in shock, I think, today. And I'm standing here wondering why me. But anyway, Betty, thank you very much. Thank you very much for two years of leading the faculty through some, some how do I put it, turbulent waters, if you like, which are now much calmer thanks to you. So delighted to be here. I'd like to um, thank Sir Christopher Frayling for coming this evening. I know it's short notice. Thank you very much for coming and addressing us. And I hope we'll work together over the next couple of years. Um, congratulations to Mary for her medal. I'm sure it richly deserved and I'd like to welcome the three new members of the, the faculty, um, Alison, Morag and Mike. Having done that, I now have to say something. So, 
I'm going to start in a fairly maybe an odd place. So when I started as an engineer in 1981, computers had just about arrived. They were now replacing slide rules, which we'd used to date, and they helped us do our sums. And this is a good thing, because doing sums by hand for complicated structures was a very um, time-consuming, burdensome, and often inaccurate method of designing our structures. Of course, now, though, computers are far more than that. They now um, dictate, almost, or control most of the processes that we go through. We had the advent of spreadsheets, the advent of project management. In fact, there's very little now we can do without them. We, we are addicted to our smartphones, literally and use them for everything, and it's changed from the computer being the thing that helped you in business to now the computer is the thing that helps you as a consumer in your private life to almost everything, as I say, you do. That comes with pluses and minuses, of course. We're now entering a whole new era, though. This might be um, not computing anymore, but something else, with the advent of machine learning. So this is how machines can now identify patterns, at least, more rapidly and more accurately than we can. They can play Go, they can play chess better than a human being. And from Daniel Susskind, um, a professor at Oxford University, I borrowed this idea that they are better than us, but different. In other words, they're only better than us at some things. And I foresee uh, a decade or two decades of the idea of man-machine partnership, of doing things together, where some things the computer does better than us, some things we do better than the computer. I mean, we all rely, I'm sure, on Google Maps to get us from A to B now because it actually knows more about the traffic situation and more about the, the three-dimensional layout of cities and gets us there more rapidly and more easily than if we were reading the map for ourselves. So what do we bring to the party? If it's a man-machine partnership, which bit is important for us? And I think it is this idea of creativity, of intuition and emotion. So. A neurogeneticist I fortunately have come across recently and had lunch with recently tells me that we spend 90% of the time using the front sort of analytical logical part of our brains, but every decision we make is made by the emotional part of our brain. And the rest of the time is spent by the analytical logical part trying to back justify why we made that emotional decision. Yeah. So that's the bit that we do, and somehow you know, the machine is going to help us with the analytical stuff, and we've got to think more about the emotional and intuitive stuff. I've spent 20 years of my life um, in Sydney in Australia and returned uh, six years ago to London. And in flying back, I sort of thought, why am I doing this? You know, what is it that's making me come back to Britain and dragging my poor wife with me and leaving our family behind in Sydney? And it is something to do with Britain's place as a creative nation. It's about the creative industries, and it's about, for me, um, engineering in Britain. Engineering in Britain is ingenious, which is also, I think, stems from the same Latin root. It's about making do. It's about nimbleness and agility. It is about creativity and engineering. It's no surprise or no um, coincidence that almost every Formula One team in the world is based in Britain because here we're driving that leading edge of what is possible, often out of garages or backyards, not the Formula One bit, but not now. But at one time it did. I, I've owned Lotus cars most of my life because I love Colin ja Chapman's um, attitude, which was to go faster, add lightness, not power. You know, other ways of doing things. So the Royal Designers, why, why we're here, um, why I'm here, that they are, we are, you know, some of the best designers in the country, by definition. We are very diverse in what we do. Um, one of the wonderful things to me as an engineer was to join this community of fashion designers and graphic artists and set designers and sound designers, you know, people from all different backgrounds. Almost every royal designer is striving for beauty. Um, we are measured, I think, by the, the product, if you like, and how beautiful it might be. And, of course, this enriches society enormously. This actually directly, in my view, fulfills the RSA aims of improving society. And it makes us more civilised. It amazes me how we've come to a point in our civilization where everybody thinks you can measure progress by a single figure of gross domestic product. You know, 
That's not what it's about, surely. It's not about wealth, is it? And even then, that's not wealth per capita. That's wealth overall. But it must be about civilization and how we can live a better life. I was made a thing called an Arab Fellow in 2003 um, for my ability, apparently, to design. And one of my first obligations was to give a talk about my projects and how they came about and the aspects of them I liked, etc. And the first question I was asked at the end of the talk was, how do you do it? How do you design? And I said, well, I don't know. I just do it. You know, it's intuitive, isn't it? We just do it that way. But it made me think. And I've talked to other people and learnt, I hope, a bit. And so to me, design at its essence is an approach or an attitude. And I borrowed this from Michael Wolf, RDI. Is it simply, is there a better way of doing something? You know, whatever it is that you're being asked to do or want to do, is there a better way of doing it? Is there a better outcome available than in the past, whether you've done it before or somebody else has done it before? If you um, agree with that definition, then anything can be designed. You can design a better conversation. You can design a better process. And in fact, at an Arab design school that I looked after in Sydney, having set our fellow engineers, you know, ob classic design challenges about designing objects out of paper and tape and so on. The last challenge was if you were the world government, what policy would you design to make the world a better place? And I do think you can do this. And in fact, everything has been designed, if you look at it that way, better or worse. Okay. And we can therefore design a better future and all its different components if that's what we choose to do. So design is also a process. It is a journey, I think. It is a time when you have to suspend your disbelief and find out what's going to happen without knowing in advance what that is. I was told by somebody the other day who, who joined with me for the first time and we were actually trying to design a better organisation. She said, what you do is keep more possibilities open for longer than most people. The other people are always trying to narrow the possibilities because they want to get to a solution. Whereas designers are probably doing the opposite, trying to explore everything that's available before committing to what might be the better answer. And there is a technique, and I'm going to go through this technique. This is my technique, if you will. I'm sure it doesn't apply to everybody else. But there's a reason for me explaining it to you. So there's a, a brief. You start with, in my case, we always have a client who says that there is an issue or a problem or a solution that they want. And the first thing you have to do is question that brief. So when Arab were recently asked to design the new um, Queensferry Crossing, the new fourth road bridge, the budget was established at about four billion pounds and we were asked to design a bridge of a certain capacity. But we asked the government of Scotland, why? What actually were they trying to achieve? And it turns out, actually the capacity of the bridge could be considerably less than that in the short term. But in the future they wanted to be able to expand it and add light rail. So the solution we came up with at half the price was to design a smaller new bridge for the immediate need and keep the old bridge, which has become overloaded but still had capacity, for the future needs. We also changed the approach roads and various other things. But the point is you wouldn't get there unless you question the brief. The next thing I think you have to do is start. You have to actually start trying to solve the problem. Because for me, unless you immerse yourself in the issue, you can't begin to understand the issue, if you see what I mean. And then comes the most difficult bit, and this is a bit I can't persuade my colleagues even to do very well, is to pause, to step back, to come back out of the problem, now you know what it is you're looking at, and start an inquiry research phase. What has other people done? What do we know about this problem already? What's the, the, the known state of the art, if you wish? From there, you can also say, OK, so what outcomes are we trying to achieve? What, what actually is um, our ambition here? What outcomes for, for our client, obviously, but also for society as a whole, for the planet in terms of consumption, in terms of environment, and also for us as people? What do we want to get from this design activity? You set then your ambitions. What does good look like? What would you like the press statement to be at the end of it, if you like? Or what would you like to be able to say, to brag about? And then you get to plans, and then you can get on with it. 
So that's sort of setting the scene, if you will, and then you get into the ideas phase. And this I know everybody knows, but for me, I didn't know in 2003, is the idea that you have ideas, you test your ideas, perhaps against known objectives or known marks, but then you use judgment as to whether that's a good idea or not, or whether that idea is worth exploring further, or whether you should just stop going in that direction and go in a different direction. And for me, those three things, I find I can only do now for about two hours a day. After that, you just get stale and you start going around the same circuits and you get stressed. And so it's better to go and do something else for the rest of the day and go home and do something totally different. And somehow your subconscious reflects on what you've learned. And when you wake up in the morning, and I have a bath every morning, even when I was in 30 degrees centigrade temperatures in Sydney, because that's my reflection time of what have I learned the day before and therefore, what is my strategy going to be for the day ahead? I don't stick to it, but at least that's the starting point. And then you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. So Peter Rice was an engineer I learned from, and he said this was like a hound putting their nose to the scent, and you follow it wherever it's going to go. And the point is, you don't know where it's going to go, and it's meandering, and it's non-linear, and it's sometimes chaotic and confusing. Yeah? And in particular, you don't know where the end point is. It's a very personal thing, I think, because in your using your own personal judgment, you put a bit of you into the solution. You end up a bit of your soul goes there. Even though I work on projects which might have more than 100 designers working simultaneously on the same project, each person is putting a bit of themselves into that outcome. It would not be the same if you changed any one of them. It becomes a personal thing. The other thing is, while you're designing, you're at risk because you have no answers. You're on a journey. You don't know where it's going and you don't know what the outcome will be. And sometimes you worry, will I ever get there? You know, is anything good going to come out of this? And some people find this absolutely terrifying, I found out. They want to close down the solutions as fast as possible because they're really worried about getting to the end point. The point about all that is I think I've come to the conclusion that not only do I now better understand what I personally do, but I think it can also be taught as a technique. And we have worked with ThinkUp, with Chris Wise, um, fellow RDI, to devise a course which we're now rolling out at Arab. But it still to me is a bit odd that it's only when people have been in practice for 15 years that somebody is teaching them a way of designing. Not the way, but a way. Why are we not taught this at school? Why at school is design indivisibly associated with arts and crafts, as opposed to a way of thinking which can be applied to a lot of things? Should we also have more design schools for everybody? Because if you go back to my first slides, my hypothesis is we actually need more and more designers as the machines do what they do. It's that bit of us, of humanity, that we bring to that partnership. And there is, of course, mentoring for those who have the facility one way or another, whether they've been taught or worked it out for themselves, to mentor others and encourage them in this journey. Here's another funny aspect about design. As you get experienced, older if you will, do it more often, you become better at it. But actually, you become better at it in a particular way. You begin to second guess which ideas are going to bear fruit and which ideas aren't. And in a way, that's simply a prejudice that you've made the decision before you've had the thinking. And you, gain, you begin to have a, um, your answers have a repetition or a pattern, if you like. Your designs become yours in particular. But I recently had a wonderful experience of working with Robin Levine, ceramicist, here with us this evening, on, on designing a piece of ceramics. Now, I was a structural engineer. Robin was a ceramicist, but for me, I'd never thought about porcelain. I had no idea how it behaved. I didn't know what a bowl was as a, as a structure. And to me, it was totally refreshing to bring my design technique, and particularly my skill set, to a totally new problem. Yeah. And I didn't have any prejudices, because I'd never done it before. Yeah. So whereas designing buildings, I'm becoming a bit repetitive and boring, perhaps. You know, for this, it was new. <coughs> And there are so many issues out there that we could think about. We have population growth up to about 10 billion by the end of the century, of which 4 billion are going to be in Africa. Urbanization, 
As, many, as much city is yet to be designed in the rest of the century as currently exists. Aging, one of Michael Wolfe's um, specialities as well, is how do we deal with people, or how do we accommodate, or how do we make people feel welcomed and included as they get older and become more frail? We saw one of the student awards earlier addressing this problem. Resources, we're running out, we're over-consuming. How do you stop that, and how do we stop damaging the planet that we're totally depending upon? So the RDIs and the RSA. We have to, in my view, or we should, or those of us who wish to, anyway, should work together at ways of improving society. Not engineering society or designing society, but improving the lives of people around the world. And I think collectively we could, we could do something useful there. The RDRs and the RSA, as we've heard before, have now um, convened a design advisory board under Sir Christopher Frayling. I think under the first year of its existence, it spent a lot of time on the RDI appointment process. And I think I'd like to see us um, set an ambition for the Design Advisory Board. What are we actually trying to achieve? What can the RSA and the RDIs together and other the winners of the Student Design Awards, the Design Fellows, collectively, what could we do? What would good look like? So in summary, for me, raw design is absolutely fundamental. Design is fundamental. It's fundamental to the future of the planet, let alone the future of Britain. I would like to see the RDIs widen their notion of design to encompass things where aesthetic outcomes are not the sole determinant of what's being done. Um, suggested again by a, a, a raw designer who I won't shame in front of her, this audience, that maybe every third or fourth year, we deliberately choose um, new RDIs from new disciplines and maybe under 50 years of age as well. Because whether we like it or not, we all end up with unconscious bias. We all choose people who look like ourselves. And there's a tendency, therefore, to continue the same, the same, the same. It's not that the, the people in the same fields are not worthy to be royal designers. It's just that the future might need different approaches to design, might benefit from the faculty being wider. I think the Royal Designers can get involved with education, about thinking about how design could be taught. I think we all have different perspectives. I've given you mine this evening. It's not universal by any means. It's just an idea about education. And ultimately, could designers in twos or threes from different backgrounds, from different disciplines, actually start looking at problems which are not in their discipline at all? Can we start considering some of these complex, wicked problems that the world is facing and seeing whether we could do anything to improve that? Again, that won't be for everybody, but maybe some of us would like to try that. Lastly, for me, um, design is such a, a fantastic opportunity or a fantastic thing to do, because as you explore the unknown and come up with ideas that you haven't thought of before and don't properly understand, your brain goes into learning mode I'm told, and it gives you big dollops of dopamine, and it makes you feel really happy and pleased and fulfilled with what you've achieved. So actually, to me, design can become an addiction, you know, but what an addiction to have. What can be wrong with that? So I've enjoyed all the time I've spent so far designing things, and I intend to continue to do it as long as I possibly can. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Tristram. As Betty said, I'm sure the mastership is in really excellent hands, and uh, I wish you very good luck with the two years of your mastership, which by my calculation is 730 baths, if you take one a day. <laughs> At one a day, 730 baths, that's quite a lot, but uh, I'm sure they'll be well spent. And congratulations to all the 2017 Royal Designers for Industry, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight with special thanks to Innovate UK for supporting tonight's event and the larger RSA design programme. So I now invite everyone to the Benjamin Franklin room for well-earned drinks, named after that honorary Irishman, uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, please leave the great room by either the atrium or the main stairs, 
as swiftly as convenient because we're rearranging this great room for dinner in uh, about half an hour's time. So uh, uh, there's a bit of a logistical, there's a design issue coming up. And, and please, could those joining us for dinner make their way here, back to the great room, when dinner is announced. And finally, I'd like to ask the new RDIs to remain behind just for a moment to assemble on the main staircase landing for a quick photograph. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. It's time for a drink. Thank you.